Hello and welcome to Share Your Secrets, a podcast that celebrates the diversity of food, art and community. We're Bounce Back Food CIC, a community cookery school that has been fighting food poverty in Greater Manchester, Cheshire and North Wales since 2014. Earlier this year we started working on our second fundraising recipe book, Secret Dishes from Around the World 2. It has exciting recipes from 20 countries and 20 original pieces of art by 20 local artists. In each episode, you'll find out about two of the 20 countries that will feature in the book. We'll talk food, art and community with the artists involved, get insights from guests in the featured countries and keep you up to date with what the Bounce Back team have been up to. I'm your host, Miriam Rendell. So, this week on Share Your Secrets, I'll be talking to Josh, the head chef at Bounce Back Food. I'll also be talking to Sam Thompson, a graphic designer and illustrator based in Manchester. Sam was assigned the Peru section of Secret Dishes from Around the World too. But before we hear from them, I caught up with Duncan to hear all about Bounce Back's first public cook-along. Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, We ran our very first Secret Dishes from Around the World online cook-along via Zoom last week. And the theme was Iranian. So about a week before the course begins, uh, we send everyone the list of ingredients and the the key utensils that they'll need to take part in the session. The courses have the same buy one, give one model that we've used since day one in order to teach people how to cook. So when you buy a place on the course, we can provide a free place to someone who's referred to us from one of our partner charities. Of course, it was different compared to the face-to-face courses that we've run for so many years, but actually people from all different households came together and learned how to make two really exciting Iranian dishes. And are you going to be holding any more of these public cook-alongs? Yes. um, So we've got tickets available for the October cook-along and also the November one on sale via Eventbrite. And then we're going to be running more around Christmas and into the new year. It feels like a really brilliant way to bring people together from the safety and the comfort of their own home. And as part of our plans to scale up our social impact, we're now able to partner with charities across the UK. And so... We're really excited by the potential to refer more and more free places um, so that everyone can share that, that opportunity to cook together. And what a great present to buy for someone as well. Definitely, yeah. Especially if you're into experiences, it's certainly a fantastic way to spend an evening learning two exciting recipes, uh, not knowing what the theme of the evening is going to be until about a week before when we send out the information on the ingredients that you're going to need. The other way that we've tried to make sure that it's accessible to everyone is that we've established a community support fund. So if one of our partner charities, if they ask for a free place for someone, but they need help funding the cost of the ingredients um, or potentially the tech that's involved to take part in the session is that we can support people in that way too. So yeah, it's a fantastic experience for you and for someone else in the community. So where can we sign up to one of these courses? So you can get tickets via our Eventbrite page. So on our website, just click events and then public courses, or you can search secret dishes on Eventbrite and in the online events, you'll find secret dishes from around the world. What's the theme for October's cook-along going to be? I can't tell you that. That's the whole point of secret dishes from around the world. So <laughs> so it's really exciting when you sign up either yourself or if you you know buy a gift voucher for someone else to attend, you know that either yourself or them are going to have a really interesting evening where you learn two new recipes from a different country. And it's really exciting. I mean, sometimes we do more mainstream cuisines like Mexican, Italian, that sort of thing. But every now and again, we mix it up. So sometimes you will have a Iranian session, for example, or, you know, Eritrean. So today we're featuring Eritrea on the podcast. Can you tell us anything about the recipes in the book from Eritrea? Well, it wouldn't be a secret dish if I told you what it was. Oh, so close for a little sneak preview. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I can say is that the dish that we've got in the Eritrean section is similar to a dal. Um, so it's a stew that's like packed full of flavour. But yeah, you'll have to pick up a copy of Secret Dishes from Around the World too when it comes out to discover exactly what dish we've featured in the book. Now, I know it was Lydia who was the artist who made the artwork for this particular country. Can you tell me a little bit more about her artwork? Oh, Lydia's artwork is absolutely beautiful. Um, So Lydia's a textile artist, so uses their freehand embroidery to, to bring together her pieces. And Lydia depicted a... Eritrean coffee ceremony, which is like a, a really important way for family and friends to, to relax and enjoy time together. So as part of her research, she discovered that and then put together this beautiful piece of art, which 
features in the Eritrean section of Secret Dishes from Around the World too. As Duncan mentioned, the artist assigned to Eritrea is Lydia Fernandez Arias. She's a self-taught textile artist who loves experimenting with freehand embroidery. A recent theme of her work has been Women of the World. And in her free time, Lydia runs art workshops for patients at two psychiatric hospitals in Manchester. For more information about Lydia's work, check out the episode notes on Bounce Back Food's blog. Josh Ray is the head chef and recipe developer at Bounce Back Food. I started by asking him to talk a little bit about himself. So I'm from Newcastle originally. Uh, came down to Manchester to st- study photography, did my degree here. While I was at uni, at sort of sporadic points, I was working as a chef just to sort of make a bit of money really. And did an internship through the uni which sort of was my first sort of interaction with Bounce Back and then it's kind of just sort of continued from there, I guess. What inspired you to get into photography? Um, I was interested initially, I guess, in photojournalism, documentary photography, things like that. Yeah, I was kind of more interested in the sort of like quote-unquote real side of photography or whatever when I was younger. And then the degree I did at the Manchester School of Art was very sort of on the, a bit more like, not necessarily on the conceptual side of it, but it was more driven towards like thinking about photography as like an artistic practice than a documentary practice. So it kind of like really sort of shifted me over that way. That was sort of my sort of initial interactions with photography, I guess. Is photography a hobby of yours? Do you take photos in your free time? You know, I really used to love it. I loved doing my degree. I thought it was really great. And I learned like loads of different stuff. But in a way, it kind of like not finished my relationship with photography, but it really changed it. I certainly needed to take a break from it for like a long time after doing the degree in it. And so right now it's not really a hobby, but like having done that degree really like informs the way I see the world and just being able to like decode images, especially like in the media and things like that. Like you learn a lot about like things like semiotic theory and stuff like that, which I think once you like learn those things, you start seeing things in quite a different way. And has it changed now we all have a camera phone in our pockets and everyone's snapping all the time? Well, yeah, that was kind of one of the interesting things that like it was kind of always in discussion when I was studying was that we were kind of like studying this subject that was kind of as an industry was in a way and it's kind of like death rows. You know, there's not really much need for photojournalism in the way they used to be traditionally because like that gatekeeping doesn't really exist anymore. In the way that kind of the invention of the photograph ended painting's relationship with portraying the real world and mm. I guess the similar things happen with photography with the invention of like camera phones and stuff like that. So how did you hear about Bounce Back Food? So yeah it was doing the internship at the end of my degree um, there was a, like a, a short-lived internship scheme that the uni put together which basically they were paying for everyone's wages so it was like free for Bounce Back and, and we were still getting paid so it was, uh, yeah, it was kind of perfect really. It was initially supposed to be because I'd done a sort of technically like a media degree I was supposed to be um, doing marketing but I just don't really have that much of like a love for social media or marketing really but because I'd worked as a chef basically it just sort of like was a really nice transition towards doing the food side of things and so the, after doing the internship which I think was like either six or eight weeks I then I was doing like little bits of work here and there for a long time before getting on a sort of more permanent contract. As Bounce Back's head chef what does a typical week look like? The weeks change a lot there's a degree of consistency but like one week I might be working from home entirely and another week I could be doing like loads of classes. A typical week pre-COVID I suppose we should go for typical from then would be at least two days of the week Duncan will be picking me up in his little courser and we'll be driving usually to somewhere in Manchester though it could also be outside greater Manchester that is not just the city to deliver a class that could be a class that is tackling food poverty by you know, teaching people in the community or it could be more tailored to, we work with like the Stroke Association and so on, various institutions like that, carers is the other big one. And then every Wednesday, the one thing that we're definitely doing, at least for the last year, has been doing a class with like a sort of after school club with some kids at school in Oldham. And then later that evening, we do a class for the adults in the community. And around that, dependent because every week, you know, there may be more or less classes going on. I'll kind of be at home developing recipes, writing recipes, that sort of thing. What's your favourite thing about working for Bounce Back? My favourite thing, I guess, really, is just you get to spend time 
with loads of really lovely people, to be honest. Like, I don't know, kind of sounds like the obvious thing to say, but it is true. Like, get have some really interesting and fun conversations with people. I think everyone is sort of guilty of just sort of spending time in their own social bubbles. And yeah, that's just, you know, normal, I guess, really. I'll spend at least a few hours a week just with people who've got all different experiences. And I think that's just like a really stimulating experience. Yeah, that's fun. And also getting to cook a lot of food from the house is also, you know, not too bad. (laughs) So Duncan proposes secret dishes from around the world too. 20 artists, 20 countries. What was your immediate reaction? Yeah, I mean, I was well up for it, really. We already had quite a few of those recipes that we'd developed over the course of like the few years doing the classes it was kind of a case of more refining them in terms of the workload for that so yeah I was up for more what I was worrying about was trying to work with like lots and lots of different artists trying to get them to one deadline I used to run print fairs when I was at uni like all different people off different art courses prints and it was just like chaos because obviously so many different people's like idea of like deadlines and stuff but this has come together really smoothly so that's been a really good surprise (laughs) so for those people who don't know what has been your involvement in the book because you've been doing loads towards this second book yeah so I as well as sort of like initially putting down the recipes in the first place I was kind of refining them so that they were good enough to be put in print. And then I basically ended up doing the food photography for the book, which was probably the first time I picked up a camera since finishing my degree. So it was kind of, it was a really nice experience actually, because all these sort of sporadic skills that I'd picked up over the years kind of all came together in sort of one task, which was kind of made them feel a bit more justified. <laughs> mm-hmm. So for the food photography for the book, have you been doing loads of cooking at home to capture that perfect dish? Yeah, there was one dish in particular that I had to do like four times (laughs) because it tasted fine every time or tasted good every time, but it just getting it to look right. And it's not like I've got a a photography studio set up in my house. I I don't have any lighting equipment. I've just got like a good camera. So it was always sort of subject to like, what's the natural light? Is the natural light good? And I couldn't get into like a totally elevated position, which made it a lot harder. So I was always having to just sort of work around those sort of constraints and stuff. But yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. Well, I guess you've been doing this in lockdown, right? Yeah. So yeah, certainly. I mean, definitely was a really nice task to have over a period when there was, you know, nothing else to do. It was kind of the perfect task to have in some respects. It kind of coincided with that really sunny patch. So yeah, I got to have like really nice food out in the sun most days. It was pretty sweet. <laughs> How have you been coping in lockdown? Yeah, fine, to be honest, because my weeks will like swing from, like I said before, doing lots of stuff out of the house to then maybe I'll have like a week or two where I'm like working from home loads anyway. So I'm kind of used to doing that kind of thing. Obviously, it's a bit of a head mash sort of not being able to like do anything other than that really but uh on the whole okay it's kind of comfy in a boring kind of way so i I don't know sometimes it's nice to be comfy sometimes it's bad to be bored i guess (laughs) yeah good way of putting it have you come up with any routines or traditions that you've found yourself making in lockdown yeah i think like doing lots of exercise has been really helpful i try to do that anyway but it's like it definitely helps provide some degree of structure but I feel like it's we've been in lockdown for long enough now that I think probably most people have gone through like different phases of their structure. Mm. I was doing like quite a bit of running at the start and then that's kind of given way to doing other things. And then I was doing the cookery for the book, which meant I had like sort of clear delineated tasks. What have you missed in lockdown? <sighs> I've missed nightclubs, standing next to big speakers and dancing around. I, that's kind of my idea of fun, I suppose. So yeah, I've missed doing that. Obviously, I missed family and friends. I think that probably goes without saying. So I want to ask you a little bit more about how you got into cooking. Yeah, so I'd kind of always enjoyed making food, was interested in it. Um, my uncle is a chef. I don't remember really ever thinking, oh, I want to be a chef growing up. But it, it was really nice being in an environment that was with a food focus at times. Um, I'd always w- worked in like coffee shops, making coffee, you know, serving drinks and things like that. When I was working at one in Newcastle, I used to, every now and again, I would like go and help out in the kitchen. I just kind of wanted to like, this was when I was maybe like 17, 16. And you, you, at one point I was going to move out and I just didn't really want to be eating crap food all the time. I wanted to like at least understand what went into making like good food. So I used to do that a little bit. And then started working as a chef a little bit when I was at uni. I kind of like enjoyed elements of that, but elements of it, as probably everyone knows, it can be quite like a grueling industry. And unless you're in the exact right environment, 
it's not it can go from being like really enjoyable to really not fun at all and so kind of having stepped out of that thought "Mm, you know that was a good experience but i probably won't necessarily go back to it but then through getting involved in bounce back it just kind of was like the perfect match of being able to do interesting things and do do stuff which like ethically i'm really on board with like kind of aligns with my sort of views about society doing nice things with food and also not having to be in like a sort of crazy stressful environment all at the same time so yeah good fit what's your favorite dish to eat if you have to choose one for absolute home comfort vibes i'm gonna go for puttanesca which is a sort of pasta dish oh tell me more about it it's like tomato sauce but involves um anchovies sort of capers that kind of thing but, you know there was uh you get like tinned mackerel in tomato sauce if you put that in it really kind of like amps up the sort of fish flavor that's like a really easy one to make and like you kind of always have those things in the cupboard because it's mostly made from like cupboard ingredients so yeah i think that's a good one what about your favorite dish to cook I quite like making Southeast Asian style curries with like coconut milk as the base. I enjoy that and I enjoy eating it. I think my like actual tastes are like more towards like sour, tangy kind of flavours. But I actually really enjoy making a salad and if you can get like a salad to be like the main aspect of the flavour of whatever you're eating. Instead of just being like the sort of afterthought, I think that really, yeah. I really like fresh fruit and vegetables so that's probably my favourite thing to make if I can get it right. I think a lot of people would like to channel that uh, love of making salad. (laughs) Yeah, all it involves is chopping usually, so it's kind of fast. Do you cook in your spare time or is it purely for work? Yeah, I mean, I certainly would cook for pleasure, but right now I kind of get to do that anyway. If I'm working from the house, I just get to do the two in one really. So I live with three other people. So if I'm doing cooking, often we've got loads of leftovers just because like I've had to make something specifically for work and then everyone has made other stuff. So yeah, we generally all eat together, but every now and again, it'll just kind of go slightly overflow. So I don't need to cook too much for pleasure at the moment in answer to your question. I guess your housemates get to be taste testers. Yeah, and they're, they're all good cooks as well, to be honest. So we kind of eat really well in our house, which is, yeah, it makes just living a little bit better if everyone's having nice food, definitely. And you can share it together. That makes it even better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's certainly a privilege to be able to just eat nice food most of the time. So tell me about the range of cookery workshops that Bounce Back deliver. So I guess like the main three categories are, this isn't necessarily the content, but the subcategories of where the work lies. Um, With the Carers Association providing work that's free for unpaid carers, then there's one with the Stroke Association, which is essentially the same principle for stroke survivors. And that's a kind of slightly smaller operation at the moment. And we also have classes that we do on the buy one, give one model, which is kind of the ethos that Bounce Back's built around. If someone buys a ticket to come, it'll provide a free place for someone who's been referred from uh, a food poverty organisation. That's kind of the main concentration of the work there. Then there is other things like catering, which we've sort of got into in the last year, which at first I was a bit like, oh my God, this is just going to be really chaotic but actually really all it just requires is like planning and just knowing what is or isn't going to work in your environment we've mostly done it at the same school that we do those other classes in a lot of the people that you're feeding have like the numbers the heads they're actually children so really they don't eat that much and they don't want like gourmet food they just want something that's like really normal and tastes okay that yeah the the catering ones are quite fun actually it's really weird now that we're in lockdown like all these things just seem like kind of like distant memory really that's the most of it (laughs) so secret dishes from around the world is one of the public cookery courses that you run how does that one work so that will be on the buy one give one model if you buy a ticket or are referred you'll come knowing that over the course of the two weeks you're going to do two recipes one night two recipes on the other night they're both going to be from a country you don't know what they're going to be until you get there so you know it could be italian one week and schlank in another week Mm -hmm. and then basically over developing those recipes over several years that's kind of like the content that's then gone into the first book and this book how do people react when they sign up to the course and they don't know what they're going to be cooking i think it's just a pretty much a split between oh what's it going to be but then actually i think it's good for people not to know necessarily because then they might come with a sort of like a preconception about what they're going to be eating or what the food of that country is and i think we have like lots of biases about what what we think people eat from certain countries and it's kind of good to sort of challenge them if you can you know 
in Duncan are both English people. We don't really have like the sort of cultural authority to say this is and isn't something, but like hopefully you can open people's eyes, maybe get them to taste some new stuff that can help. Mm. So hopefully. Can you tell me about any memorable people who have been part of the courses? Yeah, there's a guy called Cam from the Stroke Association. He'd worked as a chef previously. And I think for him, it was just, he just seemed to have a really great time. I think he just got a lot out of just engaging in food again in a way that wasn't just like a sort of bare necessity of eating it, just for it to be like something that you could think about. I think he really enjoyed that. Um, And I enjoyed hanging out with him. He's a cool guy. Um, Michael from Sandbatch is just kind of one off guy. I don't know how to describe him. He's just this elderly guy who's just really fun and. really good crack i mean like the kids from the school are great they're a lot of fun i don't envy full-time teachers because like an hour with them for me feels like a long time (laughs) even though they're really fun when when they're just not listening it's just like oh my god it's kind of good that duncan has the experience of a teacher because he can actually like control them whereas (laughs) i just kind of like float around just asking them to do things without much authority (laughs) (laughs) it must have been a challenge to adapt a workshop for people who have suffered with a stroke how did you go about that um, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that you don't know. You don't know what it is they can and can't do. And so I was very aware of that going into it. And you don't want to let patronise people. Mm. But then they also know what they're unable to do. So they're, they're quite clear about that. I mean, the obvious thing is, you know, a lot of people either have limited or no use on one hand. But a lot of people don't. And a lot of people have just found ways of working around that of their own accord, really as you can imagine. And yeah, I think just not being patronising and just allowing people to get on with what they want to do. Obviously, there's a sort of element of health and safety, which that is the element that you have to really think about just because obviously there is sharp equipment and that particular class is like one of the largest classes we do. So just even on a sort of supervisory level, it's a lot to be like paying attention to. There's lots of gadgets out there for helping people who have physical disabilities but we sort of found that maybe they're not actually always that good really like sometimes they can be useful but it's a real they're like a sort of one size fits all solution for an issue that's not one size fits all at all so the recipes that will feature in the book come from the bounce back public cookery workshops that you've been telling me about how do you go into developing a session on say japan or italy like where do you start I mean, countries like Japan and Italy, where they have like a sort of rich and widely known about food history, are kind of easier. The harder ones are the ones where there's not necessarily less dishes, but there's just less resources to get hold of the recipes. So in an instance like that, I'll um, look up what the national dish is for a start, because that can just provide you a starting point. I'll also try and get the grips with just what are the sort of staple ingredients, because some countries, their staple ingredients are like things that are... So Western countries, it's, they're easy to get hold of in the supermarket. A lot of Far Eastern recipes are actually also, like their ingredients are increasingly in the supermarkets. It's a lot more difficult with, say, African food. Their ingredients are not necessarily in a shop that isn't like a specialist's shop. And for someone who was perhaps in a, a rural area, they might not be able to access those ingredients. So a starting point, I just like tend to just read lots of recipes. If I find one that I'm interested in, like or a dish that I'm interested in, I'll try and get as many different copies of different versions of that and just understand why it is made in a certain way. Because often one recipe will like lead you down one way and then when you read about it, you, actually that first one was not the one to follow. So I don't know, that's probably the, the pathway I go down. So speaking to people that have done the cookery courses, how does it feel that those recipes that you've come up with, for one, bring people a lot of joy, but for two, become part of their staple recipes that they cook at home? How does that feel to know that you've influenced people in that way? Yeah, good, I guess. Um, Yeah, good. I mean, I think there's like a sort of like limited sense of ownership you can feel over recipes and food because they're sort of like global I've not like invented like the Thai green curry or something that sort of belongs to the people of Thailand or Mm. something. So it's it's nice to think that you can like broaden people's horizons and teach them new skills though, definitely. Yeah, I suppose that that's the great thing about the cookery workshops, that it's a memory that's created in a space with new people and you've been part of that. And I guess that might heighten the experience and the feelings towards those recipes. It does more than just be a recipe. It introduces people to a new culture And it's an experience that will live with them for a while. 
Yeah, you have like a really good laugh with loads of different people on any given day, really. This is a, like a very inclusive environment, which I think is really nice. I don't know, getting people uh, from different parts of the community to engage with each other, I think that's the bit that's like really enjoyable. I think maybe that is the thing even beyond the food that's the thing that sort of leaves you thinking, oh, well, that was, you know, a day well spent. So who develops better recipes, you or Duncan? <laughs> Uh, for the sake of keeping my job, I should probably say me, really, shouldn't I? That's, <laughs> <laughs> not much use if not. <laughs> Though I feel like he's got to juggle every other thing, so I should probably just... I don't really have to do anything else, to be honest. So, yeah, I'm going to say me on this, and then he can have the rest. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a perfect answer. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Josh, for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. No worries. Yeah, thank you. Earlier this year at Bounce Back Food... We ran our annual social enterprise internship. The programme ran remotely, which enabled 20 young people from across the UK to join our team. Everyone was assigned one of the 20 countries that features in the book. Here's Katie with some fun facts about Eritrea. Did you know Eritrean locals use bread rather than utensils to serve themselves portions of dishes? Eritrean locals not only shake hands to greet each other, but also bump shoulders. They will push their shoulders together three times in a symbol of friendship. Now let's hear from Becky to hear a bit more about Peru. Did you know it takes between five and six hundred hours and up to six months to spin, dye and weave a traditional Peruvian poncho? Peruvians generally receive one poncho upon becoming an adult and it is expected to last a lifetime. Nearly every weaving technique known today was invented by Peruvians. Machu Picchu is an astronomical observatory. Archaeologists are fascinated by how the 14th century Incas understood the alignment of the stars so well. The civilization built each sun temple to line up with the sun for each solstice. Thanks to our interns for sharing those facts. Samuel Tomsky is a graphic designer based in Manchester. I started by asking him to tell me a little bit about himself. So I am 26 years old. I am from Newcastle, but I live in Manchester. I've lived here for the last uh, about three and a half years. Uh, in my day job, I'm a care worker. And in my spare time, I try to do graphic design with varying degrees of success. No, I've seen your work. It looks amazing. Um, how did you get into graphic design then? Well, I studied sociology, so totally unrelated at uni. And then in my last year, I started sort of doing sort of silly sort of doodles of biro, got quite into it. And then it sort of progressed from there and downloaded Photoshop. And since then, it's just been sort of progressively building and cumulative sort of thing. And I've seen that um, a lot of your work is rooted in music. Can you tell me a bit more about that? I mean, my other great love other than graphic design is collecting records and playing them. I help run a record label with my brother and some friends. And so dance music's a really big part of my life anyway. So it was a way of, I can't make music myself like I've tried and no good. So it was a way of being involved other than actually making music in something that I love. So and a lot of my aesthetic influences come from sort of rave culture and the like. Yeah, you've done some rave flyers and record artwork. So does that work just turn up or are they bands that you're a fan of? It's a bit of both, really. I mean, having that sort of Instagram platform is a good way of meeting people that you don't necessarily know. But then there's a lot of sort of like your wider friend network, like friends of friends. And so it's a bit of both, really. But I started off doing like just mates posters and stuff. When people like your stuff, they get in touch. And it's quite easy as a platform Instagram to sort of instigate that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Instagram can be a really good place to share your work and also find influence as well, I guess. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So tell me about your favourite previous project that you've worked on. Oh, well, we just put out our third record. Designing those have been, you know, quite taxing because there's four different guys involved in it. So there's lots of different opinions, but they've been the most rewarding, I think. Partly because it's my friend's music and it's also to have that sort of physical object when so much of my work is in this sort of digital realm is really rewarding. And, and to have my, you know, record I design that I can then go and play on my turntables is, yeah, nice. But that's a good feeling. Yeah, great feeling, <laughs> for sure. And do you get your inspiration from the music or do you get given a brief for it or is it totally your thing? I know you said there's yeah. four of you kind of pooling your ideas. Usually I sort of listen to stuff and ask for sort of like rough sort of buzzwords rather than a sort of actual concrete like image or idea of an image. And I guess knowing the people who have made the music is helpful because you can sort of, you know, draw on their personalities and like, so some of the stuff's a bit more sort of organic when it's my mate George's music and my mate Johnny's music's a bit more futuristic and 
that's maybe a bit more metallic. So it's a bit of both, really, but I think every project is quite different. And sometimes it comes really easy and sometimes it takes ages. There's no rhythm and rhyme to it, really. It's whatever works. Have you ever had a piece which has just been sent back, rejected, and you've had to totally change it? Yeah, for sure. Happens all the time. I I think when I first started out, I found it quite sort of demoralising, but... The more you do, the more you just sort of realise it's part of the negotiation and the sort of dialogue between you and whoever you're uh, has the commissioned the work. But yeah, so I don't mind it so much anymore. I kind of like, and if I if I think it's still a cool piece, you know, nine times out of ten, I can probably repurpose it for a later project. So it's not time wasted. Yeah, definitely. Have you seen a progression in your work from when you started? Yeah, hundred percent. Well, when I started out, I, I was doing lots of sort of analog stuff, like hand drawn. I did a lot of stuff with collage and cutting out card, and using little elements of digital to piece the stuff together. But the more I've done it, the more I've uh, geared towards just doing everything fully digital. And I think the more that you learn using programs like Photoshop and Illustrator, which are you know extremely complex and very very sort of flexible and adaptable to a lot of different purposes. That I don't know easier just to work all within one space of like within the computer so yeah I think a lot of development in my work has been just down to sort of refining my technique and understanding of the programs I use. Tell me a little bit more about the music that you enjoy listening to. Uh, I love dance music I guess so but I listen to a lot of house music lots of sort of 90s house music and my other great sort of love is sort of like psychedelic rock sort of 70s and 60s and 80s stuff so they're my two sort of go-tos but I listen to lots in between as well pretty eclectic taste I've seen on your Instagram there's a picture of it looks like a checkered board and there's a figure standing in the middle with a red background I did a little bit of snooping (laughs) yeah no nice I'm glad snoopers are welcome everyone listening (laughs) just make sure you follow too what was the inspiration behind that it really kind of caught my eye So that was part of uh, a design initiative that's run every year called 36 Days of Type, which is an open sort of submission type thing where you're free to contribute A, B, C, D, etc. to Z and then all one of each of the numbers. And the idea is that you create a full type set by the end of the 36 days and everyone shares one a day and it's sort of like a big sort of design community thing. And that was my letter Z, (laughs) which is quite hard to tell, but... Uh, the design, I don't know what the inspiration was, other than like it had to have a sort of rough outline of the letter Z in it. I'm quite interested in stuff that is sort of multi-plane and multi-dimension and has that sort of depth. It was kind of working to those sort of ideas, quite sort of 70s sci-fi type stuff. Just a big sort of influence for me. Is that something that you've been doing in lockdown then, this 36 days type? Yeah, it started in lockdown because I just started a new job. So I was kind of stressed out getting home every night trying to quickly do another letter. And then lockdown happened and it was a sort of breath of fresh air. So I suddenly had all this time in which I could really like work on the letters and make them as good as they could be, which is nice. How have you found being in lockdown then? Has it sounds like you've been more creative than usual? I mean, it's been fine lockdown, but it's kind of just like normal life, apart from with less stuff to look forward to. (laughs) So, I mean, it's not as bad, you know, some people have had it really terrible. Like, I guess I've been able to leave the house and I've got my, I'm quite young and healthy. So it is what it is, isn't it? I mean, it's not going to be anyone's favourite year 2020, I guess. No, not at all. What's going to be your biggest memory of being in lockdown? I don't know. It's been a funny one, really, I guess. It sort of seems like we've seen the best and the worst of people, like at work and stuff particularly, you know, it's a lot of people pulling together, you know, lots of sort of personal sacrifices and having to be really adaptable. But then also there's all this this sort of strange sense of public paranoia and all these public spaces. It's been particularly sort of revealing about society as a whole and where we are, how sort of divided we are as a country. But there still seems to be some community aspects and things that we can celebrate still, I think. How did you hear about Bounce Back Food? My housemate Josh works for Bounce Back as the head chef and recipe developer. So I heard it through Josh, really. <laughs> cool. Do you, do you like cooking? Yeah, I love to cook. More than happy to come home after a shift and, you know, spend an hour and a half making dinner find it quite sort of cathartic and it's just such a sort of routine and it's a real interesting way of like understanding other cultures and yeah 
Yeah, I love food, <laughs> basically. It's the short answer. So if you could choose any cuisine, what would you cook? I love sort of real rustic Italian food. I mean, I really like Thai food as well, but I think there's something about Italian food and the simplicity and also the style of sort of communal dining, which is really, you know, delicious and also quite like, you know, spiritually poignant and the way that it brings people together. I think it's, yeah, Italian food. What's your go-to dish? So if, if you're having friends around, what would you make? Because it's sunny outside, I'd say like a nice barbecue. Like It's nice to barbecue like a whole fish or something and real good to get a veg on there and get the char-grilled veg and some nice dressings. It would be like a real nice summer dinner, I reckon. Oh, it's making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to reveal what country it is that you've been working on? Yeah, it's Peru. To be honest, I've never been to Latin America and I didn't know a whole deal about it. I knew a little bit. Yeah, it's cool. Certainly an exciting country to get. So how did you feel when you got Peru in your envelope? What was your first thought? My first thought was, I guess, llamas and the, the Incan settlement was at Machu Picu, the, the mountain one. That's, I don't know, pronunciation might be a bit off there, but I think that was the first thing I thought of. And also those uh, knitted hats with the ear flaps, because I remember I used to have one of those at school which I think are like a traditional Andean hat. That was my first initial idea. Okay, so that was your first idea. And then, so where did you go from there then? What was your process to make your piece? Uh, first, I think I just Googled Peru and just ended up on a load of sort of like travel agent sites, which wasn't that helpful. So then I thought maybe I didn't necessarily want to do a plate of food. That doesn't really work to my style of uh, illustration and design. So I thought I'd check out some sort of historical artifacts and found a load of amazing sort of gold, different Incan objects. And I was like, yeah, these are nice. And then, yeah, and then I guess I, I drew it out. I found this uh, ceremonial knife. I thought, yeah, this is badass. Uh, drew it out and then I scanned it in and, and then I digitized it, which is a whole nother process. <laughs> I mean, I'm in awe of what you do. So how do you start the drawing process? I drew it with pencil first. Just, I didn't draw any of the background. I just draw the sort of the main, the tumus knife itself. And then I go into it, I scan it in and I scan it into Photoshop. And then I use a shape builder tool, which I build sort of block shapes out of the different sort of shapes in it. And then to shade it, I create different layers that are different color tones and using the rubber and the brush tool sort of erase away to give it tone and depth. And then because it's Photoshop, you can really start playing with the composition. And then I sort of worked out the background and just took a while, quite a lot of different sort of renditions to get it all sitting nicely together. But yeah, it was fun. I love the glint in his eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those sparkles are good, right? Yeah. Yeah, put sparkles on a lot of stuff at the minute. Just adds, makes them pop. Also, the sun as well. It, it used to be part of a Peruvian flag, I believe. Yeah, the sun is Inti, who is the sun god, who is who the Incans uh, worshipped. Yeah, I just sort of added that in because I saw a few quite striking images. I saw the early Peruvian flag and just really liked the sort of shape of it and the face and thought it would work well as a sort of counterpoint within the composition. It absolutely does. I, I think it's a really striking image that you've created. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed. Cheers. Do you listen to music while you're doing your artwork? Is that an inspiration for you? Yeah, pretty much always have music on when I'm working on, on a piece. It won't necessarily feed into the piece directly, but it sort of gets you in that sort of certain headspace and where it's easier to work for me personally. But yeah, I often have a record on in the room. What about Peru? Would you love to travel there? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to go. I'd really like to go to Latin America. But I think I'd probably have to learn a bit of Spanish first. But yeah, I'd really love to. It's got such a sort of diverse range of uh, environments, Peru. You've got the Andean mountains, the Amazon, the coastline and you know, big cities like Lima. Yeah, I'd really like to go. Have you ever been published in a book before? You've done records and flyers. Is this your first book? I think this is certainly my first book. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah, it's a good project, really. Who do you think would like to read the book or buy the book? I hope, because it's quite sort of diverse in terms of, I mean, 20 different countries. I'd hope it'd have quite a mass appeal, but I know that my mum and dad have definitely got a copy. So <laughs> that's one assured reader or two assured readers. <laughs> Hopefully it's quite accessible and people are interested in the concept. 
I think it's interesting. Will you be cooking some of the recipes from it? I mean, I've eaten a lot of them a lot of times because I've been there while Josh has been refining them over, you know, the last six months. So <laughs> maybe, but maybe I'll just leave them to Josh. He's got them down to a T now, really. <laughs> Are there any other graphic designers' work that you admire? I really love the work of Robert Beatty, who is a graphic designer who lives in Lexington in Kentucky and does a lot of graphic design that I found very influential. This sort of airbrush technique that I've adopted and has sort of elements of psychedelia and surrealism, but is also sort of quite playful and futuristic. And yeah, I love his work. I think it's this sort of like retro futurism that I'm really drawn to. I have to check it out. Yeah, he's great. What about what's next for you? Have you got any other graphic design or illustration projects on the horizon? Yeah, I got some. I mean, a lot of what I was doing was work for club nights, which obviously have all dried up at the minute. So hopefully clubs can reopen at some undisclosed point in the future. It's not really looking like it's going to happen before New Year's. There's a few different record labels that I work with, so I've got some work with them. Hopefully some time for some personal projects to work on creative pursuits. Cool. So if we want to find your work, where can we find it? You can find it on instagram really you can find me at samuel.tomsky which is t-o-m-s-k-y and yeah come and give me a follow if you like my stuff That'd be great you definitely should thank you so much for giving me your time today and talking about your piece for secret dishes from around the world too yeah no problem thanks for chatting thanks to sam for telling us all about his peruvian artwork Remember, you can pre-order a first edition copy of Secret Dishes from Around the World 2 from the shop on Bounce Back Food's website. Go to www.bouncebackfood.co.uk forward slash shop to place your order. To find out more about the people featured on today's podcast, head to the blog on Bounce Back Food's website where you'll find the episode notes. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for listening to Share Your Secrets, a podcast by Bounce Back Food CIC. I'm your host, Miriam Rendell. And I'll see you next week. This episode was sponsored by Bounce Back Books, Bounce Back Foods' sister social enterprise that's based in Cheshire. Bounce Back Books are an independent publisher of books that take risks, celebrate diversity and inspire hope. They can help you plan, design and self-publish your first hardback book, then create the ebook and audiobook equivalents. Find them on social media with the handle at Bounce Back Books and send them a DM to discuss your project.